I was looking at a catalog of Monet's work, and I'm sure you're all familiar with his uh, Water Lilies paintings. Everybody knows Monet, and the beautiful, beautiful paintings that he did of his, of his pond in France, the Water Lilies. Um, so I was at the MoMA in New York, and I spent the afternoon just looking at this one painting of uh, the Water Lily Pond. And I was so entranced by it that I bought the catalog. And when I opened the catalog, there was a picture of Monet in his studio when he was actually working on the canvases, because there are multiple canvases. He did a whole series of these paintings. And this one picture of him in the studio was him standing there in a suit, a beautiful wool suit, uh, smoking a cigar. And behind him, there were these four large panels that had the water lilies on them. And I thought, that's what I have to do. Because what he was interested in was trying to create an immersive experience for uh, the viewer. And at the time that he was doing this, that was a radical concept, because typically the way we experience paintings is in very uh, manageable frame sizes. And they're usually mounted on the walls, similar to uh, these photographs here. But what he wanted to do was to make oversized uh, canvases that created a landscape or horizontal frame that was larger than your eye could possibly see at any one time. So that it, it would be, if you were standing in front of his work, it would be your body here and the paintings would be surrounding you. So I was interested in this concept of um, trying to bring the viewer into this two-dimensional pictorial space, which is really something that we're all uh, trying to achieve all the time with screens and with photographic images, with anything that's in a frame, we're trying to give you a window into the world, a window into this three-dimensional world. But we're always constrained with our two-dimensional tools. So I was interested in that kind of paradox. Um, because we are three-dimensional beings. We embody space. And so I thought to myself, how can I use the language of sculpture to work in a two-dimensional format? So that, uh, that's why for me these four uh, screens have to uh, sit on the floor. They have to take up space. They're, they're asserting themselves as um, these objects in the room that the image is sitting on. They're not trying to pretend to be a window. They're just saying we're here and we are actually a screen. And so what's playing out on the surface of the screen for me, again, is another paradoxical um, image, which is a black and white photograph that gives you a classic Renaissance two-point perspective. And on top of that is a three-dimensional rendering of these geometrical forms that we all read um, as 3D CGI graphics. So in our contemporary world today, we're constantly um, encountering screens that conflate the real or the illusion of a photographic image with a augmented type of image. It could be uh, CGI, it could be a folder, it could be an icon. When you open a computer, you're constantly uh, looking at a screen that has multiple images of different things sitting on that same surface. So what I wanted to create was a surface that kind of replicated that. It's, it becomes a paradoxical space that is trying to talk about what it is to be three-dimensional, but it's constantly reminding you that it's only a two-dimensional surface, you can't get beyond it. So that's what's going on there. And so it's really about perception and the tools that, we're, that we use to try to uh, mimic reality. And then over here, in a funny kind of way, I wanted to talk about how our brains um, make sense of the world and how we see with our eyes. So what you're faced with here are two images that are slightly offset from one another. So uh, the left image is supposed to be what your left eye would see, and the right image is what your right eye would see. And the piece here is called fixed position, meaning that when we look out in the world with a binocular view, our bodies are in a singular space, but our eyes are seeing the world through two cameras. That's how we see, but we never see that because our brains take over and bring those two pictures together and give us a three-dimensional access to the world, right? So our eyes are like cameras, which is what's happening over here. We have a camera picked 
pictorial representation, representation of space, but we're constantly asked to represent it on a two-dimensional surface. And over here, we have three-dimensional space that is being picked up by two cameras and then it's being brought together by our brains to give us a three-dimensional access to the world. I don't know if that makes sense, but it, it, there's, a, there's a paradox that goes on between how we, how we encounter the world, how we, how we encounter an embodied experience, and then this complete uh, interesting problem that we have, and how do we, how do we represent the world that we experience with two-dimensional tools. And I think if I was a painter, I would say, well, duh, yeah, we've been doing that for a long time. The cavemen putting stuff on the walls, like, they're, they're always trying to translate experience, and that's what people who do paintings, they're just used to that. But for me as a sculptor, and I think Eleanor and I, we both have been doing sculpture for a while, I've never had to worry about those problems before because I'm always making objects. And objects are really tangible things that you can hold, and they're always in the round, they're three dimensional. So, for me, working this way, uh, this is the first time I've ever done two-dimensional work, but it's really my way of trying to talk about sculpture using a two-dimensional language, basically. Um, one thing I should tell you, it's not a video. Uh, that's really important to me. This is, um, this is actually unfolding for you in real time. It's being generated by a computer. So, everything that you see right now is actually big numbers that are being crunched. Uh, all the colors that you see, all of the movement, uh, the changes in the uh, spatial relationships, all of that is, uh, is, is happening for you in real time. So, every time the piece starts, uh, it, it renders slightly differently than the time before. So, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. described. Mathematically, we see them as forms, but they have mathematical properties. And so once you have numbers attached to a thing, you, you can manipulate those numbers to change the shape of the thing. So I had to create those forms, and then I brought them into another program that then changed the numbers of those forms, so that the, the animation is actually numbers that are changing in real time. The background are photographs that I took. And those photographs as well, uh, because they're digital, they're also represented with numbers. And so as soon as you import the photographs into the, into the computer program, you can, you can make them warp, you can make them move from left to right. Like people think that that's actually a video pan, but it's not, it's a still photograph. So the computer is, is doing all this. So there's a program called uh, Max MSP that is the, the actual master who has control over the media. Does that make sense? Yeah, so, so you got the picture itself, which is what I was wondering about. So you got the, the digital information in there, yes. and then it's the program that's randomly No, I programmed it to do what it's doing. Okay. Um, so we, you can impose, I just went off. You can impose uh, different things onto the object. So you say gravity is one, um, color is another. Uh, you, can, you can set all these different parameters. Once you've decided what your parameters are, then you just say, for me, I did it as a time thing. So I said, at X time, do this. At X time, do that. So that's how I did it. I worked with two other people as well. So it, I didn't do all the programming. I did part of the programming, and then I helped with other parts of it. Yeah, but, 